Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's December 12th. All my astronomy buddies are in town and it's time for another batch of deep space updates. And as usual with these, we start off with the various rocket launches in the last couple of weeks. So we rewind all the way back to November 28th, where we had a Starlink launch. It was Group 6-30 launching from Slick 30 in Cape Canaveral. Exciting, of course, except for the fact that we're getting on for almost 100 launches this year. So we've kind of seen this all before. December 1st, there was Soyuz Progress uh, Mission MS-25 resupplying the International Space Station from a Baikonur. Also, after the launch of this, we did get some really cool little footage from space, some snapshots of the previous one, I guess MS-24, burning up, getting its Viking funeral, except that uh, when they did the Viking funeral, they sort of filled the ship with uh, the belongings rather than the trash. December 1st, we had a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg Space Force Base. This was Korea Project 425. The primary payload is a Korean reconnaissance satellite, but there was actually a lot of rideshare payloads that went along for the ride. Uh, so D-Orbit had a space tug on there with a number of uh, supporting payloads. The tug was called Daring Diego. Uh, but also, in amongst these payloads, there was IRSAT, uh, Ireland's first domestic satellite, which is awesome because I love Ireland. December 3rd, Falcon 9 it launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station Slick 40 carrying Starlink Group 6-31. December 4th, a Long March 2C from Jiquan uh, carrying a satellite called Misersat 2, which is from uh, Egypt. Uh, China has had a lot going on with Egypt in recent years. Uh, and a pair of other payloads called Jinxi uh, 2A and 2B for ellipse space time. Uh, I'm not sure what they do. I think these are uh, Earth observation satellites because they went into sun synchronous orbit. December 4th, there was something of a surprise in the China Sea, and it wasn't from China. Korea launched a satellite into orbit using an all solid fuel rocket. So uh, this was a civilian SAR satellite called S-STEP, built by Hanhua Aerospace. Uh, 4th of December, Ceres, that is a another four-stage solid rocket motor out of China this time. Um, so this company is called Galactic Energy. The mission was called We Won't Stop, and it was a return to flight for the Ceres rocket, which had previously suffered a failure back in September. But it looks like uh, this was a success. It was carrying a satellite called Qingqi 1A for uh, ellipse space time. Again, that sounds familiar. And uh, Tianyan 16 for Mino space. Again, both of these carried into sun synchronous orbit. 5th of December was Geelong 3, which is uh, only the second launch of this particular launch vehicle. The last time this went was in December of 2022. This is a year later. It's a small solid rocket you know, launch vehicle launched from a barge in the middle of the ocean. It has a 1500 kilogram payload to low Earth orbit. The payload in this game was called Huili Wang Jishu Xi'an 3, and I believe it's a low Earth orbit communications satellite. And uh, while I don't really know what it's doing, I do know that I mispronounced it. December 17th, another group of Starlink 23 satellites. Uh, Starlink Group 633 from Slick 40 on the East Coast. Slick 40 has been really getting a workout, hasn't it? December 8th, uh, Land Space once again managed to launch their Juche 2 Methalox rocket into low Earth orbit. That means they are have two launches to orbit and uh, the other potential Methalox rockets in the form of Starship and Vulcan have yet to achieve it. Uh, this carried satellites called Hongyu 1 and 2 and uh, Tianyi 33. Sun synchronous orbit, satellites, technology demonstrators. I'm sure they're doing something really interesting. December 10th, Long March 2D from China. Yao, carrying three satellites of the Yao Gan 39 group. It was group uh, 5, A, B and C. These are military reconnaissance satellites. Also, in the last few days, we've had a surprise launch from Vandenberg. This time it was a, a, a missile interceptor, a ground-based missile interceptor that was uh, intended to shoot down an incoming test warhead that was launched from Midway Island. 
And uh, I found out about this the night before. I knew it was going to launch sometime between 6.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. And I was excited because that meant it would launch into the pre-dawn sky. And it looked spectacular. Now, it didn't make the massive jellyfish. What we did see was a rocket which was moving fast. It climbed vertically at 45 degree angle. And then second stage separated in. And it was visibly making a hard turn to depress its trajectory and then finally head out towards the target. Now, apparently, this test was only the first two stages of a three-stage rocket because one of the things they wanted to test was the ability to choose not to fire the third stage to arrange for a number of uh, extra missile targeting solutions. So the idea being, if you don't need to light and burn through the third stage, then you can engage targets that are closer to the shore. We saw this, uh, unfortunately all my cameras were wrong in all sorts of ways, but it was really cool and really easy to see. Now, I had expected to have another Falcon Heavy launch and another Starlink launch, but as of right now, they are sitting on the pad uh, in Florida, they haven't moved. So, Falcon Heavy is going to be carrying the X-37B into, well, it's not clear exactly what orbit it is, but it looks like it's going to be highly eccentric. There's some question as to what the exact inclination and what the exact uh, argument perihelion will be, but, or sorry, perigee. But anyway, it, initially the launch was scrubbed because of poor weather. Then it was scrubbed because of a ground service equipment. And interestingly, there was a Starlink sa uh, spacecraft rocket that was set to launch from Slick 40 at the same time, you know, a few hours later. And it also got cancelled. So we went from having a potential SpaceX double header to a scrubble header. And I have got to say thanks to NASA Spaceflight for feeding me that line. Anyway, that is, uh, those are the sort of launches that we've had in the last uh, 14 days or so. Now on to the more general news. And we're going to start out with Hubble, which uh, began having problems before the previous uh, Deep Space Updates episode was launched. They began seeing bad uh, readouts from their gyros. These are the attitude control sensors are, that they, they use to obviously control the vehicle or to detect rotation of the vehicle. And uh, as a result of these bad signals, the vehicle went into safe mode on the 21st. They recovered it. Then on the 23rd, it fell back into safe mode again. And as of right now, they have carefully brought it back up with three gyros running. But Hubble may well be reaching the end of its useful life. And it was refreshed with six good gyros and now it's back down to three Technically, while it's supposed to need three for three axis operations, there are designs, there are operational modes which allow it to still do science with as little as one gyro working. But we wonder, will we get to see a service mission from Hubble uh, on Hubble in the future? And of course, there's some talk about the Polaris Dawn mission actually going up and at least reboosting Hubble, but that doesn't necessarily mean they would be able to affect the modify and repair any of the electronics or other hardware which is currently failing on it. NASA is also looking for suggestions, offers for other ways to service it, but it, you know, given that there's no budget for this, Polaris Dawn seals seems like a, the best bet they're going to have. Anyway, moving onwards, I talked about uh, Juche 2 uh, successfully launching to orbit. Well, China is going all in on Methalox engines. They've been showing off a subscale full flow uh, stage combustion methalox engine. Uh, ultimately, it looks like they're going to use this on their Long March 9, which if you look at it over the past few years, Long March 9 has started out as big rocket and very much evolved to something that currently looks like a, it could be a Starship knockoff. Firefly, they announced on November 28th that they conducted a successful test of their Miranda engines. So Miranda is going to be the, the engine for their sort of next step up on, on their Firefly scale. But uh, <laughs> there is also going to be the first stage engine for the Antares 330. So uh, as we know, the current Antares has a limited lifespan ahead of it because they use Russian engines and they can't really get those Russian engines anymore. So... Uh, Northrop Grumman, who operate the Antares, they signed on with uh, with Firefly to buy engines from them, and it, you know this is currently the plan. This is where where they're going. So, 
They took this test engine, they ran it at 65% power, they managed to get it through the startup sequence without destroying it. Ultimately, they want to have these engines running for something like you know, three and a half minutes, generating about a hundred tons of thrust. And they will need seven of those engines to power the first stage of the Antares 330. Okay, over in China again, we have uh, apparently, according to satellite imagery collected by amateurs, you hire a stranger, there's been another explosive anomaly during a rocket motor test at a Jichuan Space Launch Center in China. It's not really clear what they were testing, but we do know that it happened on November 21st, 22nd. There's a short window in there between the various uh, satellite imagery, uh, but there's very clear damage to the site, a uh, black burn scar around it. So uh, yeah, this is a China's Aerospace and Science and Industry Corporation. They're basically a state-owned enterprise that in, that mostly does like missile, well, sorry, defense and space, and they are the developer of the Kwajiu rocket. And clearly they're having, they had an issue. Anyway, um, SpaceX, well, now SpaceX doesn't generally make many acquisitions, but it did actually buy another company. It purchased uh, a company called Pioneer Aerospace, which while it did a whole bunch of other things, SpaceX are particularly interested because they make the parachutes for the Dragon spacecraft. And Pioneer Space is currently undergoing bankruptcy. So they, uh, they're in Chapter 11. They have been uh, acquired by SpaceX, which of course improves the whole vertical integration aspect of SpaceX, which they are so well known for. Um, yeah, at this point, uh, I'm presuming that it's going to keep them keep them operational. Uh, Amazon, well, Amazon had, of course, been uh, planning on launching their Kuiper mission. They signed on with all the big players. ULA, Blue Origin, yes, they were going to launch on Atlas V, Vulcan, and the New Glenn. And strangely enough, had decided not to launch any satellites on SpaceX's Vulcan 9, despite it being clearly cheaper and more operational than the other ones. And now they've actually decided that they are going to launch a few satellites on SpaceX's Falcon 9. And I'm wondering if this is in response to a shareholder lawsuit that alleges that Amazon was favoring companies that weren't SpaceX because of perhaps some illogical beef with uh, SpaceX. It's certainly known that uh, Jeff Bezos still wield some power at Amazon. After all, he is probably the biggest shareholder. But, uh, you know, moving onwards. Uh, speaking of parachutes, by the way, there was another parachute story. Osiris Rex, as you know, when it came back, there was some question as to whether the parachutes opened correctly, and most people thought they didn't. Well, NASA has got to the root of this. They think they have a reason for why the parachute didn't uh, deploy on time. So... They were supposed to deploy a drogue parachute first and then the main parachute. And these would be a series of pyrotechnics that were fired in sequence. Well, apparently in the instructions, the guide, the schematics, on the signal side, there was the main wire, which was supposed to go to the main parachute. On the receiver side, the thing with the uh, actual, you know, uh, pyrotechnics, main was supposed to refer to the plate that would pop open so that the parachute could actually deploy and the drogue deployment system. So they connected main to that and they basically got the wires crossed. And that meant that instead of deploying the drogue and then the main, they cut the drogue, started deploying the main, but since the main couldn't deploy through the closed panel, it just sat there until the drogue signal fired and then the parachute deployed. Now, it experienced a little higher G-loading, but ultimately that doesn't appear to have affected the sample. They would like to test this to actually verify that this theory is correct. However, they can't really get into the sample container right now because it is still stuck in the glove box because there's a couple of fasteners on it that are locked in place and they haven't developed a technique for freeing these fasteners 
that won't contaminate the material. Yes, we could just drill it out, but then that would contaminate your pristine asteroid material with metal shavings, and you don't really want to do that if you're talking about the science of things. As we speak, Vulcan uh, is on the launch pad doing its wet dress rehearsal, and it looks like they've had a couple of problems here and there. And according to Tori, it's sounding like this is going to push back the launch by a couple of weeks. They were going to celebrate Christmas by launching on Christmas Eve, and that was going to be exciting, but looks like that's not going to happen. This is a mission that has to hit a specific launch window so it could carry payloads to the moon. And it sounds like it's now going to be launching in early January. And January is, by the way, looking to be an incredibly exciting month for moon landers. There's going to be a number of landers that are get, attempting to get to the lunar surface and hopefully land there softly enough that they can actually do some work afterwards, unlike most of the previous attempts at this uh, in the last few years. Uh, in sort of more, I don't know, speculative world, there's a company called Helicity Space that's been getting a, a lot of press in the last few days because they've raised money for a fusion rocket engine. And while I don't know exactly how it works, other than it has a whole lot of plasma guns that get pinched down to produce a high you know, density, high energy region where fusion presumably occurs, they have got money to go ahead and develop this, and it would be extraordinarily cool if they perhaps succeeded. But, you know, it could well be something that isn't actually attainable, that the math doesn't quite work out, work out because, you know, fusion's one of these things that's always 10 years away. But maybe this time it's not. Maybe this time it's a little closer. Uh, over in France, yes, a company called Hyperspace has been given 35 million euros to develop their suborbital rocket, which normally would not be that interesting, except that the rocket is called the Baguette One. Yes, the Baguette. I know, you're kind of giggling that already. Yeah, this is going to be a 7 meter tall rocket able to launch 300 kilometers suborbital. And they will also include funding to start designing their OB-1, OB-1, uh, or Orbital Baguette 1, I guess. Uh, <laughs> to be clear, in French, I believe the root of the word baguette is like stick or staff. So this is really like a single stick rocket rather than a bread rocket. Although I'm sure with the correct oxidizer and binder, you could in fact make a rocket that ran off of bread. Uh, Getting on towards the end here, we have uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It uh, reappeared after a few seconds of disappearing. So this was a, we had this prediction that a small asteroid, actually a pretty large asteroid, would pass in front of the star Beetlejuice, which is a very bright star in the sky. And so it was, people were very excited to see this thing potentially disappear for a few seconds. As it turns out, it didn't fully disappear, which is really, it really tells you just how big the atmosphere of Betelgeuse is, that there's plenty of light coming out of the edges of this thing. But there were a few people that got telescopes on it, shot it, they saw it disappearing, and as they said, so they said, Betelgeuse, 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 and it recovered, it reappeared. And so yeah, that's most of the news this week, the interesting things. As I said, a lot of uh, astronomy people are in town in San Francisco. We have the American Geophysical Union general meeting in SF. I have been visiting the last few days and there's been some very uh, cool stuff going on. I, I love visiting the poster sessions. Here's someone that's uh, you know, developed a or designed a Triton spacecraft as a sort of summer school project. And uh, here's another one where they're looking at motions of clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere using data from Cassini and New Horizons. I've, I've said this before, if you want to get into astronomy, don't buy a telescope. Just use the massive amounts of data that NASA makes available. And with that, yeah, we are going to be off for a couple of weeks and we'll be back in a couple of weeks uh, after Christmas. So, of course, have a good one. And I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. 